Go ahead, Jennifer. This is Jennifer Cook, Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range. Thanks for joining us today for our Small Acreage webinar. Today we're going to talk about fire resistant plants. It's part two of our FireWise landscaping webinar. If you missed the first one, it's available at the Small Acreage Management website on the Colorado University Extension uh, Small Acreage website. And I'll type that in the chat box after I'm done. This webinar is also being recorded, so you can review it at any time on our website. If you are a member of the Society of American Foresters, you can earn one continuing education credit for participating in the webinar today. If you're here today and would like a credit, please type your name in the chat box so I can confirm that you're here and, and listening to the presentation. If you're new to webinars, you can take a look at the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Here you can use the chat box to communicate with Irene while she's talking or after her presentation, if you have comments or questions, she'll be able to answer them in that way because she, can, she can't hear you, but you can hear her. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Irene Shonley. She's the director of the Gilpin County Extension Office, and she's very knowledgeable in plants and interested in native, um, native plants. So I'm happy to have her here today. Oh, one more thing, uh, these webinars are made available by Colorado State University Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, so thanks to those agencies for making all these small acreage webinars available. So Irene, I guess I'll go and um, hand things over to you. So Irene's going to present for maybe 45 minutes or so, and she'll take question and, question and answers after that. So sit back and enjoy Irene's presentation. All right, thank you very much, Jennifer. So we'll just jump right into the webinar today because we've got a bunch of different things. Um, <clears throat> and so I do want to remind you that this is part two of a series. Um, this came about with um, in cooperation with Boulder County Land Use. Um, Ryan Ludlow presented last week's um, webinar, or I think it was last week. Anyway, the most the part one was presented by Ryan Ludlow. And this is sort of the second part of it, because a lot of um, what people have resistance to in creating some of these defensible spaces around their house is because of sort of the fear of um, moonscape. So let's move right on. And so again, um, this is just a very quick review from last week, what Ryan um, summarized with the wildfire mitigation top actions. Um, and some of them are three to five feet non-combustible flammable perimeter, uh, move your firewood piles, cut all grass, clean out gutters, don't store anything flammable under or on decks, and then screen your soffit. But really I wanted to talk about the forestry end of things, the tree thinning. Um, and so this is what sort of strikes fear into the heart of many people, that you would have no conifers within 30 feet of the structures. You thin the trees, so there's only clumps of two to three trees. Low limb, most of the remaining conifers to 10 feet, remove ladder fuels and retrofit with um, you know, your house, and so that's a little bit different. So what we're kind of going to address today is what happens after um, the, the fire mitigation. And so again, the first one, I hear this all the time from people, is that people don't want to cut down their trees. And I get that, but I think what's important is to, um, to sort of bring some of the, um, talk about some of the upsides to defensible space. And so basically there are many upsides, um, more than you might originally consider to cutting your trees for defensible space. And so one of them is that if you do a lot of fire mitigation practices, that the, the actual relief will promote the growth of the desirable plants. And some things that people don't often consider is that it can improve your views, it can bring more sunlight and air into the house, and also you can get fewer rodents or insects into the house. So there's a lot of different upsides. And so here's just an example is that um, this is why there's a problem and that there, you know, the lodgepole forests, and primarily I'm speaking from like a Ponderosa lodgepole forest, and those of you who are out in the um, eastern plains that might be listening to this, you know, some of the forestry parts won't apply to you, but even so, a lot of this will still apply to you. But if you cut down all the trees right around your house, um, 
you might actually find that you will improve the flowers because if you look under um, dense conifers, so either if you have very thick ponderosa forest or if you have a very thick lodgepole forest, what you'll find is nothing grows under there. And so this is an example at my house. I live in the lodgepole forest. And so we cut back. So if you look over here, um, this is what the whole forest looked like before. And so what you'll see is that, again, nothing is growing on the ground. We just had dense lodgepole. And so we did the fire mitigation around our house. And you can see the tree stumps. And yes, they could be cut lower to the ground, but that's not the point of this. Uh, the point is here that you have, um, we had all this uh, wildflowers and native grass just come in. We did nothing to this area except for cut down the lodgepoles, which are very, very good competitors for both light and nutrients. And so when they were cut down, all of a sudden the gra native grasses and the wildflowers flourished. And so that was um, a really good upside. And we weren't actually even considering that at the time, but that was a very pleasant surprise for us. And then another thing, if you're at higher elevations, aspen will come in when you remove that conifer. So there's often very, um, there's often aspen that are quite suppressed, and then you cut down the conifers that are, so the lodgepole or the ponderosa that are suppressing their growth, and all of a sudden they'll just come in like crazy. And most people up here tend to appreciate the aspen for the color, the fall color, the beautiful green in the summertime, and the fact that they're a much friendlier um, tree to grow uh, flowers and other kinds of things under. So aspen can be wonderful um, trees to have if you're at the elevation where aspen do grow. Um, if you have um, a lot of pine needles, so if you cut down the trees but you're still left with a big layer of pine needle duff, um, it's also a good idea to rake this away. So this is good for fire mitigation purposes, but it's also really good for um, trying to grow things because that dense pine needle duff can inhibit growth. And it actually can be somewhat hydrophobic. And what hydrophobic means it is, is it repels water. So the resins and the other kinds of things, the waxy um, part of the needles can actually create this layer. Even if you get the needles off, the sort of first layer of sort of decomposed needles can still be waxy and hydrophobic. And so it can actually prevent water from actually getting into the soil. And so roughing this up and getting the, the needle duff out will help with your fire mitigation. It'll also help um, the wildflowers grow because the other thing it does is prevent seeds from reaching the soil. OK, so then the next big issue that I think many people have with um, defensible space is that it just seems to mean moonscape. And I've heard people say this, I'd rather have my house burn than be so ugly. I just don't want to live someplace where it's ugly. I moved up to the mountains to uh, live in a beautiful location. And when you know it just looks hideous, why would I want to do this to myself? And so you know, here's a good case in point. So this was an article that I found in the April 2013 Boulder Home and Garden magazine. And it was about a man who had lost his home twice in recent fires in Colorado. So once in the Black Tiger fire and once in the Four Mile fire. And so the whole article was about you know how smart he was building. And you can see it's a very attractive house that he built. But look what's around it. I mean, it just sort of looks like it's on this moon lot. And he admits it's devoid of decorative landscaping. And so a lot of people look at that and they're like, well, you know, nice house, but I'm not sure I want to live there. And then again, here's another picture. So this is, you might recognize this from Ryan's um, webinar last week. And again, it's a real nice looking house and it's a nice defensible space, but it kind of looks, you know, a little junky. And, you know, granted, they may have just finished this and not put in some of the landscaping. But you know, still, it um, does look a little bit, uh, a little bit barren. And um, wow, this slide is not coming up for me right now. It's not coming up for me either, Irene. Hmm. Interesting. Do you want me to resave it and upload as a PDF? Um, I didn't think it was that big of a slide. L let's see what the next one hmm. is. Um, OK. okay. Um, that's all right. We'll just go on with this. We'll do this. Um, so this is a. Um, so here's another example, and this is again from Ryan's um, webinar that um, you know kind of has a nice uh, non-combustible space, but the area right outside the house, you know, is not all that attractive. So what I'm recommending is that we really uh, embrace the use of perennials because um, they can add both color and a sense of place to your house. It can make a, pl a, a house look settled. It can give it, if you use mostly native flowers, it can really give it that sort of Colorado mountain home feel that a lot of people feel like they can only achieve with trees around their house. But if you use a lot of beautiful natives or other kinds of things, 
you can um, use that perennials to provide that sense of space. And the perennials will be happy because now they don't have any trees to be competing with them again for light and moisture. And so they're going to be very happy in the space that you've opened up. And so here's a picture. Um, it's actually from the Betty Ford Alpine Garden. But um, you know, you've got a, a three to five foot non-combustible zone. And then you have this really great um, space where you have a lot of perennials. And so, you know, and then they have conifers there. But it kind of gives you an idea of, of something that you might be able to do. And here's just some more examples of, um, of what we might, you know, what you could do in terms of gardening at high elevation, you know, and creating some beautiful garden beds, again, outside in that appropriate location. So um, I'm seeing that somebody says the sound has cut out. Is that um, the case for everybody, or is that just one person? OK. It looks like, um, OK, so it looks like it's good for most people. I don't know why. Um, I'm sorry that your sound cut out, but I guess you can't hear that I'm saying I'm sorry. Anyway, so here's just some examples of some things that um, are you know, ways that you could put in beds um, that will be useful. And so you know, here's another just example of sort of the idea of using a lot of um, colorful plants in, in order to sort of fill in and, and, and make your house look beautiful despite the fact that your evergreens might be um, cut out. So another thought is to use sidewalks and paths right next to your house. So you, know, you have to have a path going around your house to get around and do things anyway. And so if you look at this particular house, um, you know, there's got a bare mineral soil path that is acting as a defensible space. And then you have the, um, the plants outside of that. And so you know, and there's a few choice aspen and then one tree here in the sort of um, defensible space zone. But you can see that, that that three to five foot combustible zone is acting both as a path and as, um, as uh, your non-combustible zone. So it really is very helpful to kind of think about your um, garden flow in that way. Here's just another example. This is from Crested Butte. And I just like the way that this man had landscaped his house. So again, you see a nice non-combustible zone right around his house. And then you've got some nice, um, well-irrigated um, garden beds further out. So again, you can take this concept and you can do it for your entire um, zone one. Just put in the um, non-flammable perennials and, and use that for the color and interest all the way out to zone two. And then another tip for when you're planting these particular beds is to use gravel mulch or very closely planted plants rather than, um, you know, often people will recommend an organic mulch in order to help build up the soil. So things like, you know, pine needles or wood chips or, or some other kinds of things. But when you're doing firewise landscaping, that's not really a very good idea just because a fire can burn through any of that kind of a mulch. And so we do recommend you the use of mulch, just particularly if you're trying to do um, water wise landscaping. And so the two mulch recommendations are either plant so thickly together that you don't need any mulch, that the plants are just so thick that they sort of create their own living mulch, or you use a gravel mulch. And so the pea gravel is considered to be the uh, most um, effective for that kind of planting. OK, so now I want to get into the water rights issue, because this is another huge issue for people um, because of Colorado state law. And so I will fully agree that this is a problem. So um, we do have household use only wells um, for most of, well, I wouldn't say most, but well, no, actually, I would say most. For, for most um, wells that are in the mountains, particularly if they were drilled after May 8th of 1972, and there's less than 35 acres, usually those wells are permitted for household use only. And this doesn't, uh, you know, people are not always aware of this situation. But if you do have that well permit, and you can always look it up or call the Colorado Division of Groundwater Resources to find out what your well permit says. Um, or when you bought your house, it should say what it was on the well permit. But if you do have a household use only well, your water can be used only inside the house. So you cannot water um, to irrigate your gardens, for windbreaks, for livestock, or any other outside use. And also, um, rainwater harvesting can be problematic um, because that can hurt senior water rights as well. And so um, despite the 2009 rainwater bill that was passed, the Senate Bill 80, um, which there has been massive confusion about what that does and does not allow, um, but it really only allows you to collect uh, rainwater if you um, have a resident, you know, it's residential property, if you use a well, um, if the well is permitted for, um, you know, the, for domestic uses, 
that there's no municipal water supply in your area, that the rainwater is collected only from the roof, and then here's the kicker is that the water is used only for the same purposes that are allowed by and identified on your well permit. So if your well permit is for a household use only, that means you can only use it for indoor watering. You cannot use it for outdoor watering. And so, um, so it doesn't really help most people who are trying to irrigate their lawn. And so um, people might be thinking, well, why are we even having this webinar if we have all these problems? And so, you know, especially whenever you read, um, you know, FireWise recommendations from across the country or even some of the um, recommendations for Colorado, the recommendations are in that zone one to maintain an irrigated landscape close to the home. But I've just told you many of you don't have water rights outside the house. And so you might be thinking, okay, what the heck can I do? But there actually are many solutions to this problem. And so one of them is just to, you're perfectly legally um, allowed to direct water from your rooftop or any impervious area on your property, and now you direct it into the areas you want to irrigate. So here um, is just, this is at my house, this is just a hose with a thousand um, square foot of roof area. Um, and so, and that's what our, well actually our roof area isn't even that big, but if you did have a house with a thousand square foot of roof area, you'd get 600 gallons from just one inch of rain. And so you can direct that in. But even a much smaller rain, because we don't always get an inch of rain, a much smaller rain can actually give a significant amount of moisture to your landscape. And so if you get one of these big, long, um, flexible hoses, you can just go out there and keep directing it to the water. So if we're, you know, into different parts of your garden. And so if you um, just uh, keep moving it, then you will actually have a pretty well-watered garden even if you're only getting, you know, uh, seven, seven hundredths of an inch here and half an inch there and you know just some small amounts of rain like we've been getting um, frequently this year that can help a lot. Um, if you um, have a downspout and you don't have that big flexible hose you can just direct that kind of a downspout into the garden and so this is from the um, University of Arizona Extension and they have a very um, good um, uh, culture of collect of you know harvesting rainwater because the desert is such a scarce rainwater area and so we can take a lot of lessons from them. I mean they also are allowed to collect rainwater from roofs which is different. Colorado is actually the only state in the country that doesn't allow for rainwater collection. But nonetheless we can still follow all the principles of passive rainwater harvesting. And so you can dig a depression right outside your house. So you know this area could be your um, impervious space next to your house. You could go put a patio in here or just put some sort of you know um, bare mineral soil or whatever and you do want to keep that about 10 feet from your house because you don't want to be collecting rainwater uh, in a depression right near the foundation of your house because that could cause some you know issues and you do want to have a bit of a positive drainage here but so you could just you know collect all the rainwater that comes from your roof collect it into your downspout and then direct the downspouts into this de depression and you could be um, planting a whole bunch of really beautiful plants in that particular area and collecting and keeping the rainwater perfectly legally um, another thing to do is um, to amend your soils to increase the water holding capacity. So, so much of Colorado has very little organic matter into the soil, and in the mountains in particular, we have a lot of decomposed granite, which has very good drainage, but it has very low water and nutrient holding capacity. So if you add organic matter to that soil, you can increase, increase your water holding capacity by up to 10 times. And so some of the water, um, some of the soil amendments that I recommend or alfalfa pellets, or compost, or aged manure. And what I don't recommend is that people bring in topsoil, because usually topsoil in Colorado is fairly poor quality. Um, we just don't do topsoil like some of the Midwestern states, and they're often very full of noxious weeds. Or even if they're not noxious weeds, they're very full of weeds. And so we don't have, um, so it's just not a good idea to use that kind of um, amendment. So I recommend the straight organic matter, so alfalfa pellets, compost, or aged manure to put into your um, into your yard. And so when you're um, in the recommendations, basically, is about three cubic yards of organic matter for every thousand square feet, and that translates to about a one-inch layer over a thousand square feet. And if you can dig it in about three to eight inches deep. And I know that that can sometimes be problematic um, with our rocky soils, but if you manage to get deeper than that, um, like to, if you get it down to six to twelve inches, but you know into the ground, then you'll probably want to use about two to three times um, the the you know. So you want to have a two to three inch layer on top of the soil if you can dig it deeper. 
um, just because you have more soil that you're trying to amend. So here's just an example. So this is, again, my garden. It, it only gets water from a downspout. I don't water it. Um, and I'm at 8,700 feet. And you can see that um, many beautiful plants will grow there. So you may think, OK, well, that's all fine for you. You have gutters and a, and a downspout, but I don't. And it doesn't matter. You can do the exact same principle with channeling water from your drip line. Um, and so this, uh, you know, you just have your, um, the water comes off the roof, you have your impervious surface between your house and the, um, your planting area, and then you would have an impervious channel that you would um, channel all that water into, and then you have the, your depressed and well amended soil right here, and again, you could have a beautiful garden, um, you know, right outside the house. Another method is to just contour your land to capture the rainwater. And so, um, so the principle here is, you know, and you can, I got this illustration from the Rainwater Harvesting book by Brad Lancaster, which is a very good book. And just the idea here is that um, if you contour the land against the, um, the flow, you will slow the water and you'll let it percolate in rather than just rushing down the slope and leaving your land. And so going out during a rainstorm, if it's not too thundery and lightning, um, so if it's not dangerous, but it's actually raining pretty hard and you're getting you know, water coming off the property, that's the time to go out, put on your raincoat, and go out and see where the water is leaving your land. Because all the water that's leaving the land isn't doing you any good at all. And so if you can slow it down, I mean, most of us who live in the mountains have pretty slopey areas that we're working with. And so most of that water can be slowed down and, um, and captured and put to beneficial use. And it's, again, it's all perfectly legal. So another tip is to plant by patios. So um, you know it's the same principle. So you just make a depressed planting area right by a patio to take advantage of the runoff. And so again, um, this is just you know elaborating on that same concept. And again, you might recognize this particular picture from Ryan's uh, webinar yesterday. So here's a nice impervious patio. You can see how attractive it can be, and then all the water can run off of it. And I don't think in this particular case that they landscaped this with, you know, they tried to put in some grass. And what you can see is right at the edge of the landscape um, of the patio, that extra water is promoting grass, grass growth. But in this particular area, I don't think they amended it, nor did they maybe plant it with some um, xeric plants. So, um, but this is a good example. Like if you did plant a whole bunch of xeric plants, and we are going to talk about those right in here, you'd see that you could really get um, a lot of great plants right there. Another option is to plant with the precipitation. So if you plant early in the season, we have usually a nice late snows in April and in May. And particularly this year, we had lots and lots of late snows. Um, and so if you can plant uh, plants that are hardened off or dormant, so this is a good time to plant some trees and sh shrubs, um, then you can take advantage of all the soil moisture. Obviously, the ground has to be thawed in order for you to do that. But we'll often have times where it warms up enough in the spring that the um, you can dig a hole, but it's still we're getting some of that late precipitation. But if you can't get your plants in by early May, you might want to wait until July to plant. Because if you look here, this is a typical um, mountain climate. So here's our inches of precipitation. June is actually one of the lower months for precipitation. And yet, it's one of the higher temperature months. And so that hot, um, that dry and um, you know, so it's dry and warm, and that's a very bad combination to plant. We also often get a lot of winds in June, and so it's not an ideal time to plant. And so if you wait until our monsoon seasons, which usually set up in early July, then you can plant um, and basically let uh, Mother Nature water for you, which is not only a time-saving factor, but it also saves a lot of um, uh, watering. And you know, of course, there's a water rights issue. Another thing you can do is to sow native wildflower seeds and grasses in the fall. And this is the time when they're naturally sown by the, the plants themselves. And also, because the most of the seeds need that cool, uh, wet stratification in order to break dormancy, that's the best time to plant. So they need that winter in order to cue themselves to, to that it's like springtime and it's safe to germinate. Otherwise, they don't typically germinate. And so if, you, if we have a normal moisture year, you don't have to um, use any uh, water at all to establish um, native wildflower seeds and grasses. This is how they do it naturally. It's also one of the less expensive ways to um, establish color on your property. And you can find far more varieties of seeds um, than you could ever um, going to a garden center and buying specific plants, just because there's never the options out there for you. 
And then the last is a last result. You can also haul in water. It turns out it's not all that expensive to buy some of these big, you know, two or three thousand gallon cisterns. And then you can, um, you know, often a two thousand gallon fill can be about $150. And so that's really a fairly inexpensive way to um, use that. And then you could also use that um, cistern if you had a pump or something for doing some uh, emergency watering uh, in the case of a wildfire threatening. Okay, so then now I'm going to move into sort of the meat of the what plants grow here because that's a sticking point for a lot of people is they just feel like, oh, nothing grows in the mountains. And so, you know, that's why I want to stick with my trees because, you know, I can't get anything else to grow. So let's talk about some of the plants that might work. And again, I'm talking mostly about um, plants um, for the mountains, but a lot of the plants I am going to be talking about are native to Colorado and they will do well at all zones. So if some of you are watching from lower elevations, most of these plants will do just fine for you too. And you have a much easier time in terms of, um, of you know, plant. If you go to a garden center down at the location where you live, um, pretty much any of the plants that are for sale will work at lower elevations. It's harder for mountain people to be able to select the plants. So for us mountain people, we need to be picking plants that are hardy to uh, USDA zone three to four. Um, so the plants will actually say, you know, hardy to zone four, or zone three on the label. Um, choose plants that bloom no later than midsummer. We have a short growing season, and so what is midsummer blooming down at the lower elevations is our end of summer up here. And so if you got a plant that was supposed to be a fall bloomer, it just wouldn't have an opportunity to bloom because of our short growing season. Another thing to do is to choose low water plants um, because, again, if we're trying to, you know, establish plants with without using any water, obviously you don't want to have a plant that will need continuous irrigation. And so these are usually native plants or well-adapted um, non-invasive plants. And then of course we want to avoid noxious weeds. And then obviously because this entire series is about um, being firewise, we want to make sure that as we're choosing plants that we choose firewise landscape materials. And mo for the most part, most uh, perennials um, and a lot of our deciduous shrubs are firewise um, materials. And so everything I'm going to be talking about is firewise. Um, but in general, if you're trying to figure out what a firewise material is, um, it's a plant that grows close to the ground. Um, it has a low sap or resin content. So those low ground junipers, those are really bad ideas because they are uh, like Roman candles. They just go off like a bomb. Um, whenever any embers hit them. And so those are, you know, those should be removed from anywhere um, in the, your zone one and possibly even zone two of your entire landscape. And so some of you may have junipers as foundation plantings because that was quite the rage a while ago. Um, those really do need to go away from your plant, from your um, foundation. Uh, you also want to be looking for plants that don't shed and accumulate dead branches or needles, leaves, or debris. Or if they do, then you clip them back and you rake them out, um, you know, especially as a springtime garden cleanup as we move into the fire season. And then finally, you want to look for something that's pretty easy to maintain and prune. So let's talk about some of these. Um, again, these are native or adapted and non-invasive herbaceous perennials that work well at lower elevations as well as in the mountains. First one is pearly everlasting, Anaphilus margaritacea. This is a um, great midsummer blooming plant. It has gray green leaves and these cheerful white creamy colored or cream to white colored flowers. Um, it is a rhizomatous plant so it can take up some room in the garden but uh, it also is a terrific cut flower. Pussy toes, this is one of our mat forming native plants and so this is um, it has great gray green foliage and then it can have um, there's one variety, which is Antenaria rosea, um, which has a pink uh, flower on it. It's probably the only pussy toe that really has any flowers that are of much interest. But anyway, I really just like it for its matte forming effect. So it's really good to use at the front of the border, the edge of your walkway, anything like that. Um, also, columbines are very nice to use. Um, Aquilegia cerulea. So this is the plant um, that is our state flower, and it grows well with a little bit more amended soil. Um, it goes beautifully under aspen. So if you do cut down all the conifers and you let some aspen come up, it will do very well. Um, for you lower elevation people, you want to have this in a part shade location. At higher elevations, it can be in full sun. Then we also have the golden columbine, Aquilegia chrysantha, um, and that plec 
I'm sorry, the plant select uh, logo right here is um, blocking out the rest of the Latin name. But um, it is a plant select selection, and that's just um, you know a designation for um, plants that have been chosen by a cooperative of the green industry, Colorado State University, and the Denver Botanic Garden is you know introducing some new choice plants for the Front Range region. And this is a very nice plant. It's a native to Colorado, uh, the southern part of Colorado. It has beautiful, huge um, golden flowers blooms for a very long time, can get larger and more robust than the um, blue columbine. But just beware that the um, columbines can um, hybridize and you can get some odd looking uh, flowers. I thought I had a picture of that flower, but they can hybridize. And so the yellow ones do have um, dominant genes. And so if you're trying to plant both blue and yellow ones on your landscape, um, you will ultimately, over time, as the original plants die out and the cross seeding um, happens, you will end up with just yellow columbines. So if you want to grow blue columbines, stick with the blue. I mean, sort of basically just pick blue or yellow, but don't sort of assume that you can grow both. All right, and then there's um, sages. Uh, so these are Artemisia frigida and Artemisia ludovicana. So the Artemisia frigida right here has um, feathery foliage. It looks really great in the garden, just the way it, um, just sort of the texture of the leaves. The color contrast between more green flowered plants, or if you want to play with some of the blue foliage, you can also contrast it with blue foliage. Um, if you cut it back to the ground every spring, um, it will always stay you know, sort of young and fresh looking. Otherwise, it can get a little bit weedy looking um, and just sort of woody and old and gnarly. Um, and this one on the right is Artemisia ludovicana. Um, and this is a rhizominous plant, which means that it does have underground sideways roots. And so this is a really nice plant to use to stabilize hillsides or other areas where you kind of want it to take up some space. The Artemisia frigida is um, a, just a clump former, and so it's not going to take up that much space. But in an area where it's happy, it can self-seed quite a bit. Harebells, Campanula rotundifolia. These are absolutely gorgeous, um, small, delicate plants that um, bloom midsummer. They have um, a beautiful purple flower that um, I think looks really good with many, many, many of our native plants. It self seeds a bit, never seems to come up in an inappropriate location. Um, and so I really, really like this plant. It works at lower elevations um, just as well as it does all the way up to timberline. And it's also a circumboreal plant. So this is the same plant that is the bluebell of the bluebell of Scotland. So this is a tough, very adaptable, and wonderful garden plant. Showy daisy, Erigeron speciosus. Um, this is another great summer blooming plant. It has beautiful lavender ray flowers, is what those sort of petals are actually called. Um, attracts a lot of different butterflies and looks just gorgeous. Um, here you can kind of see it in contrast with some of the Artemisia ludovicana, and that is a really beautiful color combination right there. Sulfur flower, Areogonum umbellatum. This is another very xeric, um, excellent mat forming plant. So you can use it, as you see here, um, edging an impervious space, and it kind of softens that impervious space. Um, you can use it sort of cascading over a retaining wall, um, and it has you know, great sort of uh, yellow green flowers in the summer, attracts a lot of different kinds of butterflies and other pollinators. Um, the flower, the leaves turn a reddish color in the fall, and they stay that reddish color all winter long. Um, and then the seed heads turn a sort of rusty brown, and they can also be used in um, drying flowers or that kind of thing. But I really think it has multiple seasons of interest, and it is just such a tough, big, showy, bright, extremely drought-adapted um, native plant. I highly recommend it for all of us um, from low elevations to high elevations. Blanket flower, another one that's just terrific for our, any kind of elevation that we're talking about. Um, it has big, um, beautiful yellow flowers for a you know several months in the summertime. Attracts lots of different kinds of butterflies and moths. Looks really good in color combinations with things like the penstemons, which I'll get into later. Wild geraniums are another terrific choice for the garden. So geranium viscosissimum and geranium cespitosum, they look very similar. You don't need to worry about it. If you see either one at a nursery, just snap them up. They, again, lower high elevations. 
They have a nice um, pink flower with these, you know, cool nectar guides to them, and the pink flower blooms for a good long season in the middle of the summer, uh, and then it has a second season of interest when the fall foliage turns this brilliant red, and so, um, so I think it makes a lot of valuable um, presence in the garden. I think that red fall color can look really nice with um, some of the gray-green artemisias, but you know, there's lots of options, but it's just fun to have that second season of color. And then coral bells, these are not native. Um, well, there's one that, you know, is sort of native to New Mexico and some of the, um, possibly into Colorado, but probably not, um, but the Heuchera splendens. Um, and this has red flowers, um, but the coral bells can have lots of different kinds of um, leaf patterns, and, uh, and they often will have either sort of a white flower or a red flower. I personally like um, any of the red flowered ones just because they attract hummingbirds and anything that attracts hummingbirds makes me a happy gardener. Candy tuft, uh, this is another non-native but a really nicely adapted plant. It blooms early in the um, springtime, has very clean um, white flowers and then a deep um, sort of semi-evergreen uh, foliage. And so this can just look terrific um, in the early season garden. And then scarlet gilia, or fairy trumpet, this is a fantastic plant, so Ipomopsis aggregata. Um, we, there's two different color morphs. There's the Ipomopsis aggregata subspecies candida, which you don't really need to know about, but that's the white form. And then there's a red form, and they interbreed. So there, there can be um, white crossed with red, and then you get all these sort of interesting corals and pinks and other kinds of colors. But basically, they're biennial plants. They have spikes of flowers. And the red ones are very attractive to hummingbirds. The white ones tend to be pollinated by hawk moths. But in either case, they're a very drought tolerant, interesting plant that grows well from seed. Um, irises are fantastic in the garden. So you can either have um, the, I the native iris, Iris missouriensis, which despite where you'll usually see it in boggy wetland areas, um, it grows just fine in a dry garden. Um, or the bearded iris, which also are, you know, well now known for their xeric uh, area or xeric um, capabilities. Blue flax, Linum louisiae, terrific uh, blue flowers in the garden, really good texture, bloom for a long season. Each flower is only one for one day, and then they, um, you know, will close up, but the next ones will bloom. Lupins, uh, you can get the native lupin, Lupinus argenteus, the silver lupin, and then lots of different hybrids, which all look spectacular. Maltese cross, the Lychnis coronaria, that's a great non-native um, plant. It may, you know, this is one that you will have to amend your soil and put it near your dri uh, drip line, but it is really good for attracting hummingbirds. White tufted evening primrose, Enothera cespitosa, Nice drought tolerant foliage, huge and fragrant uh, white flowers, look good in the evening, and then they fade to pink. They also are very attractive to hawk moths. Pask flowers, Pulsatilla patens is our native pask flower. Um, the U European one is what you usually can find at the nurseries, but this is a great early season uh, bloomer. Um, we've got lots and lots of penstemons that are fantastic, including our orchid penstemon on the left and the blue mist penstemon on the right. Those are both spring bloomers. And then the summer bloomers include the scarlet bugler penstemon, penstemon barbatus, and the um, penstemon strictus, the Rocky Mountain penstemon. Black-eyed Susan, Rudbeckia hirta, that's another very tough biennial plant. It attracts a whole bunch of different humming, or I'm sorry, butterflies, and then birds like to eat the seeds in the fall. Um, it's a really good plant to grow from seed. There's a lot of salvias that do well. These are non-native, but they're really very drought tolerant and attract a lot of different pollinators. Golden banner, Thermopsis divericarpa. Really good um, rhizomatous plant, blooms early in the spring, good for holding down hillsides and, er and for erosion control. And then now I'm going to quickly go into some native shrubs. Um, so these can provide good color and they can provide height that perennials can't um, provide. And they often can provide fragrance and attract birds. So it's kind of nice to have an area where in that first 15 feet away from your house where you may be using uh, perennials and then to have shrubs kind of out on the edge. So you do, the recommendation is to plant even a deciduous shrub about 15 feet away from the house. 
But you know, as you're planting them, think about planting them in groups so that they can provide cover for birds. Because again, an objection to cutting down trees around your house is that you know, well, that's where my birds came in, and you know, if I don't have birds in the winter time, I think I'll go crazy during the long winter. And so, if you plant some, um, you know, cleverly, um, pl you know, strategically planted shrubs, then you can give that cover back to the birds. And if you put bird baths nearby, that can be useful. Um, if you plant at the edge of your patio, then that can you know, um, restore the visual privacy that you may lose with some of the trees. Um, and it can provide that sort of low you know, area when you're sitting. You know, the, a shrub that's four or five feet tall can provide you with visual privacy when you're sitting at a patio. Um, you can also plant them at the far end of the perennial bed um, on the landscape edge. But again, you don't want it to be a ladder fuel for your trees that are out in zone, um, zone two. I'm not quite sure what that last bullet point was supposed to be. I apologize for that. So let's talk about these real quick. So serviceberry, Amelanchier alnifolia. This is a, um, a spring blooming plant. It has beautiful white flowers, edible berries in the um, summertime that you can eat or birds can eat, and then a lovely red fall color. Kinnikinnik is a mat farming plant. It has um, glossy green leaves and then pink flowers in the springtime and red berries. So this one does not transplant well um, and it seems to require a trip through an animal's digestive tract in order to germinate. So you can't just collect the berries and plant them where you want them to. So they seem to grow where they want to grow or I have sometimes seen them for sale at nurseries that do sort of more specialize in native plants. And then there's a red osier dogwood, Cornus solanifera, uh, white flowers in the um, early summer, red, white berries that then the birds will like to eat, beautiful red fo fall foliage, and then it has red uh, canes that look beautiful against the snow. So this has many seasons of interest um, and works well uh, at higher elevations, at least, with no water. Um, I think at lower elevations, it does require a little bit of extra water, but at higher elevations, you can use use it in this um, sort of no water scheme. Creeping Mahonia is a bone hardy xeric plant. It is a uh, Mahonia repens. It has um, lovely uh, honey flavored or smelling um, yellow flowers in the springtime, and then it has blueberries that are kind of bland, but the wildlife likes to eat in the um, late summer. And then the foliage turns a reddish color and stays that way for the entire season. Choke cherries, um, prunus or potus virginiana, long racemes of sweet smelling white flowers in the springtime, nice red fall color, and then it has cherries which either um, you can eat or birds and also bears uh, relish quite a lot. Shrubby sinkfoil, um, potentella fruticosa or pentafloides fruticosa, uh, or floribunda, sorry, that, that's, a, that's a typo there. Um, this is a great um, Summer blooming plant, it has scads of yellow flowers all over it, very attractive to both bees and butterflies. Um, and this will just brighten up a landscape for a good long chunk during the summertime. Golden currant, another one of my favorites, Ribes arium. If you get the right varieties, they'll have a spring, um, or a clove fragrance in the spring. So they have these yellow flowers that do attract hummingbirds. Um, they have uh, berries that are currants that you can eat um, or you can leave for the wildlife in the in late summer and a beautiful red fall color. Um, so uh, multiple seasons of interest, a highly recommended um, shrub. And then wax currant has, uh, is a little bit hardier in terms of both elevation and in terms of its xeric qualities. It has pink flowers in the springtime. It's one of the very first plants that a hummingbird can use when it comes through its early spring migration. Um, and then it does have uh, red currants that are um, edible later on in the season, again, for either you or for wildlife. And so it doesn't turn the red fall color and doesn't have fragrance, but it's a really nice plant to have in your yard. And then woods rose, um, Rosa woodsii. This is um, a plant that has beautiful, fragrant uh, flowers in the spring. It has often a reddish fall coloration and then hips that are very attractive in the wintertime and that also are um, uh, good for birds to eat later on. And so I'm looking, uh, Diane Chafee says, do all these berry shrub attracts bears? So they have the potential to attract bears. They don't always you know, attract bears, um, but 
usually if there's a berry bush, it's not going to attract a bear to hang around your house. So they may come, they may strip the um, berries off of a particular bush and then they move on because they know as they're foraging that, you know, once you strip the berries off a bush, it's done. And so they're not going to be attracted back and back to your house. Like if they find trash out frequently, they know to come back and like, oh, this is a good house to come back to. Whereas berries, they'll just sort of treat it as a once and done kind of thing. Also, the birds will often eat all the berries long before the bears will ever find um, the berries at your house. But if you're very, very concerned about bears, then um, you know, avoid choke cherries and currants. Um, you know, you might want to stick with like rose hips, and um, the service berries would also be attractive to bears. But it's one of those things like you know, bear, uh, trying to attract birds in, and you know, sometimes bears will come along with it. Boulder raspberry, Rubus deliciosus, has beautiful, large, white flowers in the springtime. It's very xeric, works at lower elevations and higher elevations. Um, and it has sort of dry um, berries, so they're not delicious berries, despite the name. Um, but they are dry, but they are attractive to birds, but probably not particularly attractive to bears, just because they don't they tend to be drier. And then um, a near native, which I dearly love, is the Cheyenne Mock Orange, Philadelphia, Louisiana. This had such a good year this year. It was unbelievable. There was just, I mean, this isn't the picture from this year. I should have taken a picture this year. But um, just unbelievably loaded with these fragrant flowers. It was just, you know, you walk outside and you just smell this flower. And everyone was asking, what is that plant? What is that plant? So my one at my office, one at my house, both just were so beautiful this year. And then just um, finally, um, I'm trying to wrap up and allow some questions here, but do be aware of noxious weeds. And so there are some noxious weeds that are illegal to grow, and they will cause a lot of disruption to our ecosystem. And so even though they will grow without irrigation, we really highly don't recommend it. And they often can appear when you um, disturb your soil, so if you're digging an area and amending it, or whether you're you know, bringing in equipment and getting fire mitigation done, um, sometimes they'll just pop up out of the seed bank in the soil, so they're just dormant in the soil. Or sometimes they can come on the equipment of the people who are working on your property. Or sometimes you can you know, accidentally plant them as an ornamental. And so just real quickly, I'm not going to really talk about them in detail because I want to wrap up. But we have cheatgrass. We have yellow toad flax. And these are just some of the you know, ones that I've noticed that come in, um, particularly after fire mitigation or around you know, that kind of thing. Um, Oxide daisy, tried to forward the slide, I think I'm going too fast. Um, thistles, we can have both Canada and musk thistles, so this is the Canada thistle is a creeping perennial, musk thistle is a biennial. I'm going too fast for what the slideshow can keep up, but I'm almost done. can't tell if it's advanced for you or not. Um, that may be the end of the show. OK, because it's not. Uh, I thought there was still one more weed. But anyway, um, there's scentless camile that I thought was on there. And maybe it is coming out, um, but it's not showing up for me. Anyway, um, so basically, that's the um, presentation. And I want to do a um, quick poll before I get into answering some questions. So let me um, turn this up. And so you're welcome to type in questions. But if you could please, um, before you get out, um, uh, please um, rate your knowledge gain from this presentation. And then um, while you are voting, I'll just sort of take some questions. So um, yeah, so Sue comments that Mullen is another one that can take over. It absolutely can. I just wanted to touch on some of the highlights. So there's there's a lot more noxious weeds in that. That's why I gave the um, Department of Agriculture website. So there's you know about um, you know I can't remember what the number is, but there's like 50 some odd uh, noxious weeds in the state of Colorado. So but those are some of the you know obvious ones that come in. But yes, Mullen is certainly another one. So. Um, and so then Ryan is asking, is it possible and or legal to harvest native wildflower seed? So that would depend on what land you are um, asking about. And so if, it, um, if it's, say, on a county open space, you would have to check with the particular policies of that county open space. Um, if it's on US Forest Service land, um, you would have to get a permit from the, um, so if it's, so for example, um, in the Roosevelt National, Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest, you'd have to talk to and get a permit from 
that um, ranger district, and um, uh, if it's you know if it's uh, your friend's property, you would just have to ask them that. If it's county right of ways, you'd have to just determine that from your county right of way. Um, so I think I've covered most of the land use. If it's a state park, usually they don't allow it, but you might be able to get a permit from it. So um, so there's a, a variety of different things. You'd really have to just determine the land ownership and find out what the policy is for that particular land ownership. Kathy mentions, thank you for mentioning the weeds. You bet, Kathy. I'm the weed manager for Gilpin County, so I'll, I always mention weeds whenever I can. Um, Robin says, do you know a commercial source for wildflower seeds that I recommend? Um, you know, there's several different ones um, that um, you can, uh, well, actually, if you go to the Colorado Native Plant Society website, so C-O-N-P-S, Colorado Native Plant Society dot org, C-O-N-P-S dot org, um, there, and then you go to, like, resources, there's a suggestion for, um, you know, for where there's both retail native plants, so you can buy them, you know, in uh, containers, you know, as an actual plant, or suggestions for some of the native seeds. So that's where I would say is the best resource for um, finding the different native seeds and also native plants, because, you know, it's hard to grow these shrubs as a native, you know, as a seed. Um, so, um, and then Barbara Dobbs asks, are there any risks of hybridization with natives using any of the plants you listed? So, um, so any, so most of the plants I listed, I would say about 80% of them were native, but the, for the ones that were, were not native, there are no risks of hybridization. Okay, so again, um, so the recommendation for the native plant nurseries um, would be the same. Just go to the Colorado Native Plant Society website, and um, there's a bunch of different ones listed. And go for the retail ones, because there's wholesale and retail, and as a homeowner, you'd be going on the retail end of things. So thanks, Jennifer, for typing in the website. And then... Um, Vanna says, how do you collect the seeds from Scarlet Gilia? I have a lot this year. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you have to go and visit the plant. There's a very short window of time between when the seed capsule is mature and when it releases all of its seed. And there's also each one of the, the seed pods as it goes up the plant matures at a different time. And so if you want to collect the seeds, you're basically going to have to visit the plants every single day, essentially, and look and see which ones are ready but haven't released their seeds. And so you're going to have to look um, and, and see that. And I know, it's tough. I mean, you could also just let them seed around themselves um, unless you wanted to, um, you know, give them away to somebody or plant them in a specific plant. Um, so Jean is asking how firewise is the Rocky Mountain maple? That would be another fine choice. It's a deciduous tree. It doesn't have a lot of resins in it. And so, you know, if you wanted to plant one of those and then have it be, you know, 15 feet away from your house, that would be another very nice choice. It has, you know, it's a fairly tall plant and it has a really pretty yellow fall foliage. And then it has nice, um, you know, the seed pods are very nice. Looks like we've got a couple other questions coming in. Okay, is anyone interested, Patricia says, is anyone interested in six inch to three foot ponderosa and Douglas fir trees putting in a new road and would like them to be replanted? So I guess if you um, are interested, then uh, private chat um, Patricia on there and she uh, can set you up with some ponderosa and Douglas fir trees. Uh, and then Ryan asks, um, have you ever tried transplanting aspen? Um, it can be done. It's pretty tricky because... Um, as you probably know, it um, is connected by underground rhizomes, so all the different aspen are just one big clone, unless you happen to have gotten one to grow from seed. And so um, the tricky part is that it stresses the plant tremendously when you sort of con disconnect it from all of the rest of its clone. And so, um, but, you know, if you can kind of grab up a large piece of the rhizome with and do it with a small tree. You don't want to do it um, with a large tree. And the best time to do it is when it's dormant in the springtime. So before it gets in any leaves out, you would um, try to dig it up with a large string of the rhizome and then transplant it. And then you'd want to you know, water it in. Or if you had um, you know, still late snows, that would also be another option. And then um, Robin mentions that she's been told to um, avoid having aspens in a septic leach field, and that's absolutely true. You actually don't want to have any kind of 
woody plant in your septic leach field. So everything should be at least 30 feet away from your septic leach field for, um, so that it doesn't get into your, um, the pipes in your leach field because that can be pretty expensive. Okay, so on the, um, on the website, you don't see a resource link. So there's tabs up on the upper, I mean, you know, unless they've rearranged it since I've looked at it in the last month, on the upper thing, there's a tab that says something like resources. Um, so look on that. So it's, you know, the not, and then there's like, you know, so there's like, or plant um, resources or something. You know, if anyone can go on that website, I can't do it while I'm talking, um, but if anyone who can navigate that and find out exactly where to do it, but I think it's like towards the upper right-hand side, the tabs, I think, says resources on it. Okay, um, and then Patricia O'Neill says, uh, how do you con control Canadian thistle around water sources? So it depends on, um, you know, I mean, this isn't a weed class, and so, you know, probably we don't really want to get into that, but um, it depends on what kind of a water source you are, but you can often use an herbicide that you would paint on as opposed to spraying, because then that keeps the, the um, herbicide from getting into the water source, and so that would be a way that you could control it, um, you know, so you want to use an appropriate herbicide, but if you paint on, then it's not an issue around the water source. Okay, and then Kathy Shelton says, under committee, oh, I'm sorry, so it was under committees. Thank you, Kathy, I appreciate you going and finding that. So it's under horticulture and restoration. So I guess they have um, uh, rearranged the website a little bit since last I saw it. It seems like they're always monkeying with it, which is great, um, but then it means that I can't off the top of my head go and tell you where to go. All right. Um, Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate you grabbing that up there. So that's the website that you'd go to to go and find um, sources for both seeds and for um, native plants. And again, look under the retail areas. So um, those are good, um, good places to support. Any other questions? We have some, but a couple of people typing. All right. Um, all right. Well, it looks like there aren't any other questions, uh, or well, maybe there might be one coming in. But you're all very welcome. Um, I hope this was helpful. So I hope this combination of having the um, Ryan's talk about sort of you know the forestry and the home ignition zone area, and then this discussion about how you can actually um, you know make it a pleasant place to live, um, will. Uh, inspire you to go out and do um, good things around your landscape. We fortunately had a very um, a fairly wet year. This could change um, you know, in fairly short order, but um, I think that this will be um, something good that we can take forward into all the different years because you know the weather seems to be getting drier as we go, so we all have to be very concerned about the wildfire. So, All right, thank you all very much. Have a really good um, afternoon. You're all very welcome.